Good afternoon or good evening, everyone, depending on where you are. Uh, it's Marco Minghini here from uh, Italy. I have the pleasure to chair this uh, penultimate talk of the academic track uh, at the State of the Map 2020. Uh, just as a reminder, this is the third edition of the academic track, and uh, today we have 10 talks. This is the penultimate one, and uh, I have the pleasure to introduce the speaker. Uh, who is Annie Young, a resident fellow at the Mansueto Institute for Urban Innovation at the University of Chicago. Um, Annie's research uh, interest lies at the nexus of poverty, place and politics and uh, focuses on understanding how the processes and technologies of knowledge making, especially the creation and the use of digital mapping tools, affect communities and populations living in marginalized neighborhoods internationally. Before joining the Mansueto Institute, Annie spent four years with the Slum Duelers International, where she was responsible for the data ecosystem of the organization, uh, from community managed data collection to data platform management, analysis, and partnerships. So we will now see the video and then we will be back for the QA session. Enjoy the video. Kuyamora, Unjani, and hello. I am Annie Birkes. I'm resident fellow at the Mansueto Institute for Urban Innovation at the University of Chicago. The title of my talk today is Detecting Informal Settlements via Topological Analysis, and it presents the work of our Million Neighborhoods Initiative research team here at the Mansueto Institute. It is an enormous pleasure and privilege to be able to participate in the first State of the Map conference held in Africa. We would like to thank the organizers, especially the scientific committee, for including our paper and for still making the conference possible during what we appreciate has been an extraordinary set of circumstances. A special thanks to the OpenStreetMap community and especially Missing Maps volunteers who have and continue to map and improve the data our project is built on. We would also like to appreciate the communities and practitioners on the ground, especially in Vintuk and free time, who indulge us, challenge us, hold us accountable, and remind us that we need to do this work together because knowledge production is a collective and collaborative endeavor, and that our work must be usable for them to drive impact, transformation, and action in their communities. I will kick off our talk today with a brief video to introduce our institute and the Million Neighborhoods Map. I will then move on to contextualize our work within urbanization in Sub-Saharan Africa, and then the contribution of our work in terms of methods and application. The inspiration of this work comes from our previous engagements and experiences with communities in Sub-Saharan Africa and India. Many slum and informal settlements communities, including those affiliated to Slum Brothers International, have been developing and refining the processes of neighborhood reorganization called blocking out or reblocking to improve accesses, create public open space, and improve security in their settlements. We found the existing models and processes of reblocking often time consuming, approached in piecemeal, costly, and even disruptive socially to the community. We wanted to develop a general I beg your pardon. We wanted to develop a generalizable and systematic method that could help identify at scale at the block level in cities where the most underserviced neighborhoods are and develop tools and methods for analysis to support local communities and their governments to improve and transform conditions in poor neighborhoods. The foundational scientific research using topological analysis was done by Krista Brailsford, Taylor Martin, Johan, and Louis Betancourt at the Santa Fe Institute. I will include links to these papers at the end of this presentation. The expansion and real-world application of this work has since September 2018 been led by Louis Betancourt and me here at the Mansueto Institute. The research and computation and therefore full credit to enable a more universal application with the minimum data model that is openly available, was developed and implemented by Sitesh Soman, Cooper Nederhood, Nico Marchio, and Annie Yang. The Mansour Institute for Urban Innovation is a new institute at the University of Chicago. It's dedicated to studying the processes that create and sustain cities. 
When you go to developing cities, the city's still forming, and you'll find many places where people have settled and don't have streets coming in to deliver electricity or sanitation. And it's critical to create all these services that allow people to live good lives. The Million Neighborhoods map uses this premise of, of connectivity and seeing how well connected are different neighborhoods across a city. Say, for example, I'm the mayor of Monrovia, and we look at this map together with our communities, and what we will see on this map is two places that light up bright red are West Point and Eskado. And so already there, we know that these are neighborhoods that are underserviced and in need of infrastructure access. And then this can help elicit a dialogue between the city and the, the communities being able to collectively engage around what this evidence means and how we could move into actionable intelligence within, within our city. Researchers at the University of Chicago have one of the longest traditions of looking at cities in terms of neighborhoods. When you look at any city, you will find that it often to work at a larger scale misses sort of the, the human touch, the human need. And the idea of the Million Neighborhoods map is to start mapping cities in this way, to have a whole vision of the world. So in putting it all together, we can see change and learn from examples of success in places, and at the same time adapt those solutions to new contexts, like eliminating extreme poverty, creating good urban services everywhere, improving people's health, everywhere on Earth, for everyone. It is expected that by 2030, approximately two out of eight people will live in urban slums and urban informal settlements across the world. In 2010, 294 million people lived in sub-Saharan African cities and towns. In the next decade, the sub-region's urban population will grow to a projected 621 million, according to UN data. While megacity Lagos and the other big two, Kinshasa and Greater Johannesburg, will continue to grow, According to analysis by David Satterwave in 2017, the most substantial proportion of the urban population in sub-Saharan Africa do and will live in small and intermediate-sized urban centers where local governments lack responsive urban governance structures, suffering adequacies in the provision of basic services, and have very little capacity or funding to fulfill their responsibility for providing good living conditions and good health for their residents. Human development in terms of life expectancy, education and income in sub-Saharan Africa remains at the low end, below 0 0.550 out of 1.0. And it is going to require massive collective and coordinated action. And as we dare to advocate, recognizing and seizing the opportunities these cities and their neighborhoods present for sustainable and equitable development over the next 10 years. There has been an unprecedented effort to exploit remote sense data, street view images, machine learning, advances in field work and scientific methods, and spatial data technologies to detect and understand how cities are growing and where slums and informal settlements or infrastructure deficits are. Among these are the work of Kit and All, Coley and All, Wurm and Taubenberg, and the Seto Lab at Yale. Our contribution uses vector data, the topological analysis of building put footprints in relation to the existing street networks as a pathway towards near universal criteria for determining whether a neighborhood could be an informal settlement. With a topological approach, it is possible to determine the number of building parcels a street inhabitant must cross to access the street network and therefore access for emergency services or connection to sanitation and water. To measure street access, a K index or block complexity, which falls on a non-zero positive integer scale, has been defined. When the K index is equal or smaller than 2, it means all buildings in the block have direct access to the streets. Values greater than 2 reflect blocks that are incrementally less accessible. The K index may be interpreted as the number of buildings a person would have to pass as they move from the least accessible building in a block to the nearest external street access. Computationally, the K-index is the number of weak deal graph interactions required to cover all buildings in a street block, moving from buildings along the street edge to the innermost building. Focusing on topological invariance allows us to analyze cities without respect to the specific morphology of their street network. To create a global index of underserviced city blocks, we extracted open data on building footprints and street networks from OpenStreetMap 
and applied a topological analysis to each extracted street block to characterize the level of spatial accessibility. In addition, we used administrative boundary polygons from the database of global administrative areas. Starting with the initial street network, the geometry of the street network can be extracted via the well-studied method of polygonization. In polygonization, the self-intersections of the street network are determined in order to define the block geometry. Most GIS packages offer a polygonization feature, for example, estimate polygon from first gist. In implementation, though, we found a set theoretic approach to be more stable and performant. By buffering the one-dimensional line strings comprising the street network with a small buffer radius, we obtained two-dimensional polygons capturing the outline of the street network. We then find the set theoretic difference between the administrative boundary polygons and the buffered street network polygon. This renders the negative area between the street network geometry as a collection of polygons. These negative areas are precisely the street blocks we are trying to extract. In Brailsford and All's initial attempts to apply K-index calculations to neighborhood analysis, cadastral maps were readily available. But this is not the case for everywhere in the world. To scale the analysis, a method for approximating cadastral or parcel maps was needed. We use a Voronoi decomposition of the street block geometry with features of the building footprints as inputs to the Voronoi algorithm to approximate building parcel boundaries. In a classical decomposition of street block polygons with building footprint footprint centroids often results in cadastral boundaries that intersect the building footprint polygons, CA. This is of course not an ac accurate reflection and finding optimal routes to each building that can access requires parcel boundaries that do not intersect building footprints. To guard against these intersections, we instead generate a Voronoi decomposition of the street block polygon using the building footprint vertices and regularly spaced samples of footprint boundaries as input points. Each resulting Voronoi cell whose centroids are vertices of the same building are then union together to provide a cadastral approximation that does not intersect the building footprints as demonstrated in B. With either exact or approximate cadastral delineations, the topographical approach to underserviced neighborhood or informal settlement identification can be applied to every extracted street block in the city, as shown here for Freetown. The cadastral parcels are taken as the initial faces of a planar graph. This planar graph structure has a weak deal, a corresponding graph formed from connecting the centroids of each adjoining parcel centroid. We term this structure a weak deal since incomplete faces are discarded, and so taking the weak deal of the weak deal does not restore the original graph. Instead, successively taking the weak deal of the weak deal forms a sequence of planar graphs. Every sequence of planar graph weak deals will converge to a trivial graph in the form of a tree. The number of weak deal operations required to achieve a trivial graph or the length of the weak deal sequence forms the k-index measuring spatial accessibility. This approach has two advantages. It reduces the problem of dealing with varied morphologies and building block densities across cities, street blocks, to simpler comparisons of scalars. This approach locates precisely what a street block where the least accessible areas are by examining the parcels nearest to the final trivial graphs. The graph above shows the summary distribution of block complexities in Freetown, Sierra Leone. We can see that the largest number of blocks do not fall within the higher k-index ranges, i.e. many of the blocks in the city are more or less accessible at low k uh, complexity. With targeted investment and community participation, the city could probably move a large number of residents towards more equitable access to services provision, making gains while developing pathways for the more complex city blocks. What may appear like an insurmountable problem before now shows up as probably quite manageable. More on methods. To convert the cadastral maps to a planar graph, each cadastral parcel's boundary is decomposed into finite segments and aggregated into a collection, while keeping track of the original parcel to which each boundary component belongs. The elements of this collection are compared pairwise, where adjacency is established between 
two parcels if any of their boundary components overlap. For small street blocks, this is not a severe computational bottleneck, but it becomes intractable for the larger street blocks in our data set. To get around this, we build a spatial index of edge components and compare each boundary component to the end closest components that do not belong to the same parcel, rather than comparing each component to every other component. We find that N100 is more than sufficient to accurately represent the adjacency and connectedness of observed planar graphs. The spatial index implementation we choose is an R tree, which is a variant of a B tree whose nodes have a fixed number of M objects and contain information about the bounding box of each node's objects. An R tree of node capacity M has insert complexity proportional to M. So building the R tree for C boundary components has overall complexity O and C. With the R tree built, the planar graph construction requires a constant number of comparisons per component in C. So the index construction implementation is linear in the total number of boundary components of the street blocks parcels. The trade-off for this improved performance is the increased memory requirements of maintaining the spatial index, i.e. computational power. With the adjacency structure of each panel determined, the construction of the weak deal is straightforward. For each parcel, we construct an edge from that parcel centroid to the centroid of each adjacent parcel. Then the collection of edges is traced to determine the polygons that will become the faces of the current graph's weak deal. Now onto application and to bring us full circle back to what we discussed right in the beginning around reblocking and how we are hoping that this work can help support communities and local governments. With each building's access to the formal street network or lack thereof analyzed, we can now provide suggestions to the local community about how to connect each building to the existing street network while respecting the existing building footprints with potentially minimal cost and disruption. The green lines represent a reblocking proposal for Kibera in Nairobi. In this iteration of the reblocking algorithm, we abandon the efforts involving stochastic graph searches and approach the problem using Steiner tree approximations to gener generate the optimal street network. To frame the universal access network as a Steiner tree problem, we segmentize the building parcel boundaries to create non-terminal nodes at each segment boundary and create a terminal node for each building parcel lacking direct street access by placing a node on the non-street parcel boundary closest to that building. We then construct a complete subgraph of all terminal nodes where the weight of each edge is the Euclidean distance between a pair of terminal nodes. Each existing tree segment has a zero weight. Solving the minimum spanning tree problem on this subgraph and then recovering the original path segments gives us the optimal new street network. Our approach, of course, has limitations. One already mentioned is that we do require exceptional computational power to do the backend work. However, the map is fully available online and even on your mobile device. Other limitations include false positives. For example, street blocks where lack of public access is intentional, for example, embassies or universities, military bases or enclaves, may show up as informal settlements, as it does here with the U.S. Embassy in Monrovia. It is also possible for a well-known um, slum um, like Neza in Mexico City um, to show up as a well-connected um, neighborhood because it has relatively high levels of street access. Therefore, street level access alone is not a complete determinant of informality or slumness in, within the urban fabric, and other core services may also be lacking. All results of our project are available on our Million Neighborhoods website, and we invite you to visit us. We invite you also to contact us, um, and as our data is freely available to researchers and our code is available on GitHub. As promised, the original scientific work that was first developed by Brailsford and Orr um, are available at these links. And we look forward to engaging with you on our data um, and also to build this map further.
All computation was performed on the university supercomputer known as the Midway, with technical support from the Research Computing Center. We have a suggested data citation, and we also ask that you please credit the OpenStreetMap contributors and the University of Chicago when using and distributing our work. Thank you very much for your attention, and we look forward to engaging with you in the questions and answers section and beyond. Please follow us at MI Urban Chicago. Thank you very much. Bye, Danke. for uh, this interesting uh, talk um, and thanks of course to all your co-authors. Uh, I think it was a quite uh, technical talk for sure and um, uh, that's why it's in the academic track I, I think uh, but I think uh, uh, that we all agree that uh, uh, what we are speaking about is actually possible because we are speaking about a data set that is of course OpenStreetMap that uh, is so um, uh, high scale and so detailed that actually allows this kind of analysis. So makes really those analyses possible. And that's really, uh, of course, it's, it's uh, let's say, granted for all of us because we are the OSM community, but it's something that we should always uh, remember to acknowledge. Um, having said so, um, there was a lot of activity in the in the pad. Uh, there are comments more than uh, questions, but I'm happy to go through the comments because I and I would ask Annie to clearly reply and provide your feedback to the to the comments um, uh, as well. So the first one uh, is these: um, if those cadastral maps that you mentioned ever leaked to the community, they would go nuts. Hey, that's my land. You gave it to neighbor C, etc. Um, do you have any comment here, any on the use of uh, cadastral maps that you mentioned in the in the in the talk? Any, I think you are muted. Okay, please. There, I'm back. You are muted. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry about that. Um, the, is that the Zoom disease, right? <laughs> to be muted while you talk. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who took the time to join our talk and to who stayed until sort of like right to the end of this of, of the conference to hear us. And 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 uh, thanks for all the comments already. I'm um, I'm excited for this discussion. Yeah, I think that the um, the cadastral map. Um, for us, like sort of, it's it's sort of a, a back back end application at the moment because it is really more of a heuristic, or it is a way that we need to um, to get to um, uh, uh, doing the rest of, of 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 the work, which is to try and find this optimal optimal path. So um, the cadaster, I think that that is something that, of course, you know, if the um, there might be, of course. Uh, um, in the future, there might be interest from communities or cities to to sort of have a look at this to see if there's a possibility to equally, you know, equitably distribute land um, uh, in informal settlements. But this is not our goal to sort of, it is more sort of for us, um, the generation of this cadaster um, is really to understand how the, um, how the land is is allocated around around um, around the building footprints. And of course, this is not a, uh, this is really sort of a, like you mentioned before. It's a highly technical application, and um, we are aware of the of the of the social implications. I.e., I'm the social anthropologist on the, on the team. So, um, yeah, it's it's more of a, um, a part of the method to sort of determine um, where the the how how dense blocks are and accessible they are, and also then in the future how we can propose. Um, uh, um, ways to expand the street network so that all the buildings in a particular block are connected as best as possible. Thanks a lot, Annie, for the for the um, detailed answer. Uh, we have another question from Serena um, um, that asks uh, if you can uh, comment on informal settlements detected in South Africa. 
Ah, <laughs> yeah. So um, our map absolutely depends on um, on uh, um, uh, data available in in OpenStreetMap, and this particular data set that is available now on 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 the map um, um, on our site um, is from July 2019. So there's also a bit of a lag um, in terms of what is available. But because the data, especially, it depends on building footprint data. And um, the street network, how well that is that is mapped and, and documented. And um, we have seen in places where, um, for example, if the data doesn't exist, we probably can't, you know, we can't detect, <laughs> we can't detect the, the informal settlements. And this is also why we're sort of really um, encouraging um, the community and, and our partners that we work on the ground with to sort of really get into mapping um, their 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 regions on OpenStreetMap because the only way we can improve the map and show sort of a better picture um, of the reality on the ground is um, if we have the data which is coming from OpenStreetMap. So if there are um, places missing that you know there are informal settlements, then please we encourage you to 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 set up a missing maps uh, mapathon and uh, map away and organize your community around getting those structures um, into OpenStreetMap. Thanks a lot, Annie, for the for the answer. Um, there's another question uh, which is a bit long. I'll try to uh, I'll try to read it uh, uh, very carefully for all the audience. So you discussed reblocking, and in your paper you show how we observe that new infrastructure segments typically appear as a dead end street, as the minimal edge set needed to connect a collection of nodes will always yield a tree graph. But a street network of dead-end streets is notoriously mm -hmm. harmful to walkability, <laughs> as in USA suburbs, and will result in residents having to take long network distance walks when the absolute distance of their trip is short. How can help ensure these will not be used to design neighborhoods that are difficult to walk in? Thanks mm -hmm. for your fascinating talk. And this is from Taylor. And thanks, Taylor, for the detailed, but I think clear um, um, question and, and comment. Yeah. Thank you very much, Taylor, for your question. Um, of course, the, we we are fully aware of the of the cul-de-sac problem, and um, uh, both Cooper and Satish, I know they are working um, uh, continuously to try and figure this out. What the open reblock. Um, um, it's it's merely a proposal. So this is not what we're trying to say. This is how um, how the community should organize. What we really what we really want is for communities and the city governments and anyone who has a stake in 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 the neighborhood to be able to use this map just as a starting point, as a as a as as the beginning of of their discussion. So our primary goal was first of all we wanted to be able to get everyone on the same map. And then these maps should be iterated with the community. So really, um, uh, uh, Cooper is in the process of, of developing a, a, um, a plug-in for, for QGIS, which we started uh, working on uh, when we were in Namibia recently and before COVID started, which would actually allow people to, um, to, to manipulate the map um, themselves so that they can move so that we can do it, uh, avoid exactly these kinds of issues um, that you mentioned. Is that we are not saying that this is the um, this is the the map that you should use to to organize your neighborhood. We're saying this is a proposal of how you could do it, and we really want people to interact with it. And and the great thing I think about it is that if you have different different um, segments of the community working on the same map and coming up with different ways of how they want to organize the streets and the roads and, and, and accessibility, then um, I think it opens up the space for more voices to be included. And so it is not to say this is the way, it's to say this is a proposal, how do we come together and make it the best for our community? And so we have a very strong um, engagement with, with our community partners on the ground as we're building it so that we're not giving them the answer. Um. Thanks a lot, Annie. Uh, we have another question. Um, uh, I, I'll just read it. So maybe this is off topic uh, regarding the above example in one, Mon Wabizi Park. Uh, city planning wise, how would their situation be improved? For example, in regard to accessibility. Um, oh, thank you very much. Um, I'm not I'm not familiar with uh, Mon Wabizi Park um, exactly. Um, but I think that, um, as I was saying um, earlier, is that the the 
the milieu neighborhoods map and, and the open reblock algorithm is really sort of um, the first steps and initiating steps in getting a discussion going with the community and, and local government. And I think that the complexity of upgrading, the complexity of life um, in the city, I think is, is something that we, we, have, we have a lot of respect for. And this is why we, we, are not, we are not trying to present a solution. We are trying to present um, the beginning of a discussion around solutions and not just one solution. So I think this is sort of um, where we really try to ground our work is that although it is sort of um, highly technical in a sense, um, as I said earlier, the connection for us that it is actually cities and their communities who should be using these maps um, for their own local development, that is the key that we want. We do want to elicit a dialogue with, with the work that we're doing. Thanks a lot, Annie, for this uh, uh, answer. We have another question that I, it's a kind of a follow up of something that you have previously said uh, mm -hmm. that uh, the model actually depends on the uh, availability and the completeness of the, of mm -hmm. the data, of course. Um, the question is, is it possible to assess or compare the quality of the settlements with the OSM boundaries? Oh, okay. Um... Let me just, um, is, is, um, uh, thank you very much. Sorry, I just want to make sure that I, I have the question correctly. Is this um, boundary set that, that is um, within, with, within OpenStreetMap? Um, what, we have, what we have been doing is we have been looking at, uh, we were very lucky to have um, Digital Globe or Max, Maxar as they're known now, um, who have um, given us access to, to a couple of, 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 of cities where they have, um, um, building footprints generated from high resolution data. So what we've been able to do is to compare, for example, the, um, to run the, to compare the, the coverage um, of, 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 of footprints. Um, and then also to, um, how should I put it, to see how, you know, based to compare the two data sets, but also to see how, where the gaps are um, in, in the OpenStreetMap data or in the, in the other data. But for us, really the goal is to, to, to use right now just the building footprints and the street um, street bound uh, street um, networks, and then the boundaries for the for the cities, for example, we took from the from the um, whoa the, the big database. Let me just quickly <laughs> um, um, the administrative database of um, that's available um, online and that is access the database for um, of global administrative areas. We use that as boundaries for the cities. Thanks, Annie, and I hope that this answered the, the, the question. I hope so, too. If it doesn't, please, please um, get in touch and we'll, we'll be happy to, to, to answer <laughs> it more fully. Thanks. Uh, there's another question that is actually uh, from me, um, and uh, it's about the software. So which software did you use to perform the work or to run the model in general? And also a question on the source code. Is that available in, uh, in the interest of the reproducibility of this research? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Marco. Okay, the software is a highly technical question. I think uh, uh, I, I would not venture to say what the, what the guys used. I know they're all sort of versant in, in Python. I know that they, um, using using normal sort of GIS uh, software, ran into ran into trouble. So you 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 can't sort of do these these computations. So I think they sort of sort of wrote wrote the code themselves. All the code um, is available on GitHub. Um, if you go onto 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 the uh, Mansueto Institute GitHub site, all the code is there. Um, especially interesting, I think that uh, we've had comments around the 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 making of the cadastral map, um, sort of the modification of the usual Voronoi algorithm. So that it's all there. So please um, engage with it, um, help us improve it. Um, it's a it's a community tool, and we want to to build it with everyone. Thanks a lot, Annie. Um, actually, we still have uh, a, yeah, some more comments about the um, cadastral maps. Uh, okay. I would like to thank the person who is still writing in the chat. Unfortunately, okay. we don't know the, the name of the person, but there's a lot of discussion that, of course, because it's, uh, yeah, I, I think we can potentially go on and discuss about this a lot. I can just maybe quickly read uh, the additional comments, and maybe if you have a quick feedback, Annie, you can mm -hmm. feel free to give one. Um, so um, again, uh, coming back to the previous discussion, um, even uh, real cadastral maps are sensitive, usually due to not being aligned precisely, even that it is a source of endless arguments. Even slightly out of date 
state, real cadastral maps are destroyed by governments to avoid misunderstandings. No matter if there is a big warning, not a real cadastral map, people will take it as the real thing. Um, all the buildings I trace from imagery are skewed several random meters thanks to Bing, etc. I hope you have better grasp of real WGS84 location. And yeah, I would like to thank uh, GI Danny for this uh, set of, uh, I would say, interesting uh, comments. Uh, I, I, I agree that we could potentially uh, stay here and discuss forever about cadastro, <laughs> but I would leave maybe a final statement uh, to, to comment on this. Um, thank you very much, Yudani. Um, this is, I mean, it is, a, it is a very important discussion. And I think that, as Marco says, we can discuss around this forever. I think um, um, Erica also yesterday in her talk, you know, she started out and saying how, you know, the, the map in Africa, right, was divided in, in, in Europe, like the power of maps. And, and I think, um, again, we are not proposing a cadastral map. I think this is, this is really important. It is a heuristic for us to, to try and get... Um, to get uh, uh, a proposal for for street level access, um, I think with the with the, but I also think that there have been amazing projects like um, the STDM projects um, that uh, uh, UN Habitat has been running, sort of in, in 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 Uganda, where once you start doing sort of a more community communal and community-based understanding of land and how land is owned and distributed, the tenure of these of, of land, um, when it becomes not a dictation, but an engagement with communities. And I think this is where, for me, the agency of mapping is so powerful, is that you actually put the power of of, of mapping and of, of determining what the map looks like in the hand of uh, in the hand of, 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 of the community who lives there. And I think that we shouldn't, I always try to, to say that even in these hard discussions, like around cadastral maps, instead of trying to see all the all the problems that are that they that they present, just to see what are some of the opportunities that we can engage with within those contexts. I know, for example, in Liberia, um, there's land that's owned by people who left Liberia uh, during the civil war and have never returned, and and the government or the local community can't access that land. So I think it's more for us to start a conversation of, around these things and see how do we engage the different stakeholders, because at the end of the day, um, we need to engage these questions in ways that are that are equitable. And just to say that uh, um, we have to to not have this discussion, I think is, is not good. So I think that, you know, with every every attempt to try and show something, it also opens up an opportunity for dialogue between different different um, actors and it can move the move the conversation forward. Thanks a lot, Annie. And uh, I think we can uh, maybe spend one additional minute to close this uh, uh, talk. I would like to thank you and uh, all the research team. Of course, we are not uh, physically together, but uh, you would uh, have received a very big applause uh, in this moment. Uh, and I think you totally did deserve it. Uh, so I would like to thank also the people who are active in the TED and all the people who asked uh, questions. Finally, please remember that the academic track also produced some proceedings, which is a collection of all the abstracts. So you will find mm -hmm. all the proceedings, including Annie's one, um, on Zenodo. So you, you can just look uh, and on, on, a, on a search uh, engine, uh, something like uh, uh, SOTMA 2020 proceedings, and you will easily uh, find them. Of course, they are open access, and they uh, give you some more uh, details, of course, on the work that was presented. So that was it. Uh, thanks again. And for those of you who would still like to follow the academic track, uh, uh, see you in the next uh, uh, talk starting in five uh, to six minutes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>